heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 284, covering the week of October 18th through October 22nd, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page where you can find this podcast along with a lot of great lectures or Abbeville U videos. The YouTube page is great. has a lot of great stuff on it. We're really proud of a lot of the videos we have on there. And some of those videos get a lot of views, and you can argue with a bunch of idiots on there who like to post comments. So if that's your thing, if you like to go on social media and you like to argue with idiots, you have a wonderful opportunity on the comment section on some of those videos, particularly those that deal with the war or secession. You have, of course, all the armchair righteous cause mythers that like to go out there and show what they know to all those neo-confederates. So it's, it's always really fun to see that. Also, go to abbevilleinstitute.org, give us an email address. You'll get a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's how we keep in touch with you, that email address. It's vital for our information. Our, our social media presence is limited because of big tech. So we like the email. I mean, this is what we this is how we tell you what's coming up, what's going on. Uh, we are looking to have a Zoom webinar maybe this next Wednesday. We're chasing. I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. Probably have to move it to the next week, the 1st of November. We only have two of those left this year. So this last one, October, early November, and then probably one early December uh, that we'll do. So we're only going to get 11 in this year. And that's okay. We take time for... Thanksgiving, we like, even though it's a Yankee holiday. Uh, but, you know, the first Thanksgiving was in Virginia in 1619. It's supposed to be at least the first English Thanksgiving. You can go back to Florida if you want to look at the first Thanksgiving here in North America. But regardless, it's a Southern institution to begin with, but the Yankees co-opted it. So we like to take a little time off there. And, of course, we take time off uh, right around the last couple of weeks of December and early uh, early January. So, uh, we do take some time off. Uh, you are going to be getting some emails from us. If you are listening to this and uh, you're on our email list, we're going to be asking for donations. I mean, this is the end of the year. If you're making your tax preparations, consider the Abbeville Institute. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, you like the podcast, our events, our, our videos, all of that stuff, please consider that donation. It does help us further our cause. And again, you'll get emails about that. Make sure you whitelist the email address uh, for the Abbeville Institute. Make sure you know that it, you get our stuff. And I know you get one a day, so that might seem oppressive, but we're just sending you the articles we put out. This is what we want to do. We want you to see what we're doing. It drives traffic to the website, which of course helps us get more views when people do Google searches. There's a reason why we do all this stuff. We want people to get our side of the story. We want people to understand what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And you, listener, are part of that. It is important. It's imperative for us to have you click those links. Even if you just don't read the whole thing, you just click it. You open those emails. Even if you just open it and discard it. When you do things like that, uh, you, you contribute. Give us a monthly contribution of a couple dollars. I mean, we're not asking for you to go out and break the bank. Two dollars a month, three dollars a month. That's twenty five, thirty six dollars a year. I mean, that's good, right? We we love it. If we got everybody on this email list and our email list and uh, everyone that listens to this podcast, if we had people just giving us five bucks a month, everybody on the list, we would be in high cotton with some of the things we could do. So. Think about that when you're thinking about your plans and your budget. I know, you know, five bucks, things are going up, but that five dollars, maybe, uh, you know, it's five dollars a month. That's a cup of coffee. Uh, that's a, you know, that's a, a eating out one time at a at a fast food joint, you know, a value meal or something. We're asking you for a value meal a month, and this is what you get. You get all the stuff. You get the scholars that write things. You get the podcast. You get the web events. You get the events. You get all that stuff that we do. The videos free of charge. All that stuff costs money for us to do. It costs money for us to do these things. People cost money. I mean, all these things cost. So I'm making an appeal to you to do this kind of stuff. And think about that in your financial plans for 2022. 
and at the end of 2021 for your tax preparations for the year. If you want to save a little money, we are a 501c3 organization. So you can write this off on your taxes. If you gave us $1,000 or you give us $50, it doesn't matter. You can write that off on your taxes. So think about that. You know, it is a charitable contribution. Also, if you can make us your Amazon smile, if you go to Amazon Smile, you look at Abby Bill Institute, every time you shop at Amazon, you give us some dough when you buy something. You buy a book, you buy a, a printer cartridge, uh, you buy a cl piece of clothing, you buy whatever you buy at Amazon, some electronics, whatever it is. You get something there, a toy, and we get a little cash on the back end. Fantastic, right? So we, we get a little money out of that. These are things you can do to help us do some things with the Institute. Also go to abbevilleacademy.org. That is our new academy. We set up all those old webinars we've done. They're all for purchase, available for purchase there. So if you missed one of them, they're $15. Again, those make a great gift. Click on that click on that shop tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. Get our embroidered material. You get that. Christmas is coming up. Order those shirts. Order those hats. Do those things. Let people know you like the Abbeville Institute. Let them know you like to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. These are important things. And this week at the Institute, we had a lot of good stuff. I mean, I really was happy with the material we had this week. And I think we've got some good articles next week, too. But uh, this week, we started off with Boyd Cathy's piece uh, entitled, Our Solemn Task as Southerners. And this is the introduction to his book, The Land We Love, the South and Its Heritage. And when you think about what the South, the Southern tradition offers, I mean, this is where we're, we're trying to sell this, right? I mean, we're trying to sell the Southern tradition to younger people. And my own podcast, and if, you, if you like this podcast, you should head on over and check out my, my podcast, which is the Brian McClanahan Show. But I talked about this week the fact that all over there, that wokeism may have reached the high point and it might be coming, might have crested and coming down the other side. Millennials want something. Millennials want something different. Generation Z wants something different. They realize some things are broken in America, that things aren't necessarily right. And when you think about so many things that Americans are angry about, what are we angry about in America? Well, we're angry about corporatism. We're angry about big banks and people making money and breaking the backs of others. Americans are angry about that stuff. We're angry about working class people getting abused by the man, by government, by corporations, whatever it is. We're angry about that person in another state telling us how we have to educate our kids or how we have to live our lives. These are things we're angry about. What can the Southern tradition offer for that? Whether you're on the left or the right, what can it do? Well, it offers a reprieve from that. It offers people the opportunity to say, you know what? We're going to live our lives, and you're going to live your lives. And if we could just break the uh, the cash drip, which is so in, I mean, so important, a lot of people sit there and think about, well, what federal funds can I get out of this? What kind of grant can I get out of this? You break that cash drip, and you break your reliance on these people. See, what they try to do is buy people off. They buy them off with cash. The states, the school districts, whatever it is, they buy them off with cash. Individuals? People have lost that independence. That's one thing the Southern tradition teaches people, to be independent, more independent. To try to break yourself off from these things in modern society that are actually keeping you in bondage in many ways. I mean, this is something that is important. And the whole key to understanding all of this is understanding what the Southern tradition is. It's Jeffersonian-based. It's old Republican-based. It was America. There's a great lecture on our YouTube when the South was America by Don Livingston. But I've uh, I've talked about that on this podcast. This is, you know, we've had almost 300 podcasts now, and I've probably talked about it a hundred times at least on this podcast about how the South is America. When we think of what the American tradition is, it really is in our mind conceptualized as the South. This is what we think of it. Now, I mean, there's certain parts of, you know, other areas of America that come into that too. But this is how we think of it. So when we, when we do that, right, when we think of these things, the Jeffersonian position offers a response to that. Small is beautiful. Small is better. 
resistance to urbanism, resistance to cancel culture, resistance to all these things, defiance to the central authority. When we talk about the Southern tradition, we look at religion. That's one thing Jefferson doesn't offer, but there's so many good examples of Southern religious figures that are important on across the Christian spectrum, from Catholics to Protestants and all denominations therein. Lots of great examples of good Southerners who were espousing the Southern Western civilization Christian tradition. I mean, this is what they wanted. This is why Lord Acton said when the South lost, essentially, Western civilization in the United States is over. It's going to be bulldozed now. But you see, the other side wants to ensure that you don't think that about the South. That The only thing the South offers is racism and slavery. That's it. That's what the South was. It was based, it was held together on the belief that blacks were inferior and that should be subjugated. Of course, there were Southerners that thought that. There were a lot of Northerners who thought that too. Not the slavery part necessarily. There were, I mean, the, 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 but the most ardent pro-slavery ideologues before the 1830s were coming out of New England. And then, of course, you had Southerners saying the same thing. And every American, for the most part in the 19th century, believed in the superiority and inferiority of one race or another race, right? I mean, this was, this was common in the United States. So to place that all on the backs of the South is just stupid. But this is what they want to do. They want to create good guys and bad guys. And who is the foil in American history? Well, it's always the South. It's always a Southerner, whether it's John C. Calhoun, who in the 19th century is the big boogeyman for uh, for American historians. If it wasn't for Calhoun, America would be all right. Or if we can make Jefferson out to be the bad guy because he was a slave owner, or Washington because he was a slave owner, or John Taylor of Carolina, or Abel Upshur, or as we move forward, then it's Jefferson Davis or Robert E. Lee. If we could just not have those guys, America would be all right. We get to the 19th century, late 19th century, it gets a little harder because Southerners really didn't have a lot of power, but yet we had the lost cause. So if we look at the local level, then if it wasn't people for like, like John, the, the uh, lame lion of Lynchburg, Daniel, if it wasn't for people like him, or Private John Allen. What's interesting about Private John Allen, this is a funny, and I talked about him on a couple podcasts ago. He actually made a speech in Congress. He's from Mississippi now made a speech in Congress blasting a Northerner for not supporting the equal funding of public schools in D.C. They were segregated, but saying that white schools should get a quarter more per student than black students. This is the guy from Mississippi chastising the guy from the North for that. Interestingly enough, you find a lot of these things, if you just start going back and looking at history... So we have that, and you have all these... Southerners in the 19th century, these were the bad guys, right? You know, A.O. Bacon of Georgia. I mean, who, I mean, these are the people that we've got to criticize in the late 19th century. And then you get to the 20th century, and Southerners, well, at that point, then it's just Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow, see, Woodrow Wilson was a progressive, but now he's not a progressive, he's a Southerner. The progressives... Say, well, look, I mean, problem Wilson, he was a Southerner. I mean, come on. He wasn't really that progressive. He's a Southerner. How could he be? How could he be that progressive? He's just a Southerner. If he wasn't a Southerner, he'd be a good progressive. But because he was a Southerner, he was a bad progressive. <laughs> so that's how they work around that. And, of course, you have all these people in the early 20th century, the UDC and others, they're foisting this lost cause myth, and it's all these bad people. And then you get to the middle of the 20th century, and you have all the people like Sam Irvin and John Eastman and all these other Southerners and, and uh, Richard Russell, all these people that are just going to be the bad guys in society because they're from the South. And think about what happened to Joe Biden. He actually praised some Southern congressmen. Oh, my gosh, the progressives were having none of it. You can't say anything good about these former Southern congressmen because they were segregationists. And so, yeah, we don't like segregation now unless... Uh, the left wants to do it, but uh, I mean, then the left is okay with it when it's their idea and they want to do it. 
Uh, but we don't like segregation now. I think it's, uh, I mean, most Americans are on board with that. Probably 99% of Americans, we shouldn't segregate people based on race. It's not a good idea, right? I mean, it's, that creates problems in and of itself. So let's not do that. Uh, but um, I mean, we can't we say there were good things that these people did? Sam Irvin was the darling of the left. He was the darling of the left when he was attaching, attacking Richard Nixon. But yet... Oh, but wait a second here. He opposed the civil rights legislation. Well, why? If you actually go out and read why, he told you why. Because it would lead to all the nonsense we have today. Because it was an unconstitutional abuse of power by the central authority. That's what he said. So when you look at what the Southern tradition offers, it offers a lot. It offers constitutionalism. It offers an economic model that's different from the current state capitalist model that puts people first, as uh, the Callaways said, Fuller Callaway Union, I'm, I'm running cotton mills and making Americans out of that. I, I don't expect people to, to be anything but people. I can't expect them to work like an animal. They're people. So you got to put people first. It's a more humane, paternalist kind of labor. I know we say that, oh my gosh, paternalism, that invokes images of bad things. But isn't that servant leadership? This is, I mean, paternalism, you know, kind of a family-oriented environment for your workplace. That's what people want. That's what the Southern tradition offers. And I think that, as uh, Kathy points out, you know, it's it's holding on to this tradition that's so important. And of course, we have to push back on the stupidity that people talk about the South. They use platitudes and slogans and have no idea. They've never read Eugene Genovese when it comes to slavery. They've never read Fogel and Engerman when it comes to slavery. They've never read any of those things. They don't even know the literature. They just get their their history of slavery from Roots or from Django Unchained or Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer or some other nonsense. That's where they get their history from. They don't actually go out and read these things. If they read Roll, Jordan, Roll, they would have a much more complex view of the institution. And Genovese pulls no punches. Don't get me wrong. He's hard on the South at times. So are Fogel and Engerman. But you get a whole different view of slavery from those. And of course, people get upset about this. I remember I, I picked up a copy of Fogel and Engerman's Time on the Cross. And in it was a, a bunch of papers from the previous owner. And they were talking about a Liberty Fund symposium where Genovese was invited. This is back in the 90s. And Genovese was invited, and uh, it was heated because people were saying, you know, why do you believe in slavery? You're making it sound like slavery is great. Genovese never said that. What he wasn't going to do is listen to people that used abolitionist sensationalism to say this is what slavery was. He wasn't going to do it. And neither were Fogel and Engerman. They weren't going to do it. And I've never met anyone yet who actually honestly read those books and walked away and didn't say, gosh, my perspective on, on the South and on the United States has changed completely. It's not to promote or condone slavery. It's to give it the complexity that it deserves and to treat the people that were involved, both black and white, as humans in a very complex and difficult situation. Not as monsters on one end and victims on the other, even though there was victimization going on. There's no doubt about it. There was exploitation. All this happened. It's all there, right? We know that. But Genovese treats the, even, the black population as humans who were doing really interesting things. They weren't just victims. There were people doing interesting things and had an interesting culture. And I think that's something that we forget about all of this. If you just have monsters and victims, well, then you don't get any of that. It reduces it to nothing. That's where the complexity comes into play. And you get great books that we try to promote, like One in the Course of Human Events by Charles Adams. It points out the war couldn't be about slavery. It had to be about these other things. And, and look... Most social issues at the time in the United States, there, were, there was the surface issue of slavery, which it was more about the extension of slavery than anything else. All that was there. Don't get me wrong. It was all there. And I've said why slavery was important. It wasn't a moral problem. It was a political problem. This is Michael Holt. It's a political problem. Because underlying all that was this sectional conflict between clashing civilizations, clashing cultures, clashing economies, and somebody had to have the power in the general government. And if the North didn't win that out, they weren't going to make as much money. And so they had to come up with an issue to break the alliance between the farmers in the United States. It was slavery. 
They knew that West Midwesterners weren't on board with slavery. They didn't want blacks even living in their states. So if they could come up with a platform that was anti-slavery, if they could start pushing that in some way, well, that would break that potential alliance. And it did. And the West starts voting with the North. And therefore, they have the power. But this is why the populists came around in the late 19th century, because they woke up after the war and it's over. And hey, we won. We're going to have this great agrarian republic and then the bankers take over and we've got a national banking system and we've got high protective tariffs and we've got all these high tax we've got this stuff that they don't want they wanted federally funded internal improvements but they want the other stuff and even those federally funded internal improvements turn out to be corrupt you've got the transcontinental railroad going out west and you're cutting you're giving the best land to corporations and non-entities and farmers and people are losing land they're not getting what they want we cut a bad deal. That's where populism comes from. It's a Jeffersonian Southern response to New England stupidity. So you have to talk about these things where the real rubber hits the road. Yeah, slavery was an issue, and people got heated about it, and people were worried about it, North and South. Southerners were worried about it for a variety of reasons. Most Northerners were probably against it, but in a limited way. And then we have a wonderful piece from a new writer. Uh, I don't know if she, how much she's going to write for us, but uh, Julie Payne, Patrick Henry, the real indispensable man. And I like this piece. It was fun because it puts Henry at the center of the American War for Independence as the guy that was the driving force in Virginia, not George Washington. Now, George Washington, he, he was... An important, I mean, look, there's no America without George Washington, but there's also no America without Patrick Henry. And I think that's the point she's trying to make here. Patrick Henry was the leading voice in pushing for uh, the war in Virginia. There's no Virginia cause without Patrick Henry's give me liberty or give me death. He also realized that the Constitution was a, was, uh, a disaster in the making and voices opposition to it because he could see all the problems brewing from it, and it was going to be a big, big mistake. And so this is why uh, Miss Payne calls Henry the real indispensable man. And this is the same thing people like Mercy Otis Warren were saying, right? Mer Mercy Otis Warren writing histories of, of America and criticizing the Federalists. She was saying, look, they betrayed everything the, the war was about. They betrayed it all. And so I like this piece by, uh, by Julie Payne on Patrick Henry because it does such a nice job with that. Such a nice job framing Henry as a real embodiment of the American War for Independence, as the real embodiment of the Southern founding. And Henry, oh my gosh, you can't say anything good about Henry anymore because he was a slave owner, right? So, I mean, you don't even teach Henry. Nobody gets that speech, give me liberty or give me death, except for a guy standing on a desk trying to yell it as a teacher. He didn't yell the speech. He didn't need to yell it. There's no anger in it. I mean, it was a call to action, but to say that it was anger or you would scream it, it's just a complete distortion of the speech itself. And part of the thing, of course, what we do at the Institute is to point out tradition and culture. And uh, I, I want to talk about, a, of course, the piece that Paul Yarbrough wrote for us on Thursday, Tradition and Culture, and then bring that back also to Kathy's piece on Monday. Paul Yarbrough begins his piece with a, with a little excerpt from one of his books, from his book, uh, Mississippi Cotton, his first novel. I don't want to read that part to you, and then I want to go back to a quote from what Kathy listed from William Faulkner. So Yarbrough writes, Our farm was a broadly covered area of green stalks, blanketing the ground for hundreds of acres all around. In a slow-motion explosion, day by day, week by week, the land revealed the white birth of cotton, the king crop of the Mississippi Delta. There were great vines of honeysuckle on one side of the house. The aroma seemed more noticeable in the open country, too. It occupied your nostrils like a natural perfume, a fragrance of home. Also, large 50-year-old sweet gums, magnolias, and four giant oaks fortified the house and yard, forming a canopy of shade from the hot, dusty summers. There was no Bermuda grass or St. Augustine, just yard grass, crab grass, lush and green from the rich soil. We cut it with mower and sling blade. 
The house is apropos to the Mayfields in their lives, but it was almost home to all of us, and each of us was in many ways like the other. The room seemed bare, the wallpapered, brown by age and time and dust and humidity. Various prints of artwork, the blue boy, a ship sailing an unknown sea, presenting dark sails against a moonlit night. A lake in the mountains somewhere, unknown but to the artist. A clock rested on the mantel in the living room, the hourly chimes spilling throughout the house, somewhat more wistful after bedtime. The ceilings were high and the furniture was dark mahogany, firm and sturdy and had a look of dominance. Though it could be scared, it would, scarred, I'm sorry, it would hold its ground when bumped by an elbow or a toe without a slipper, though it shared its masculine power with a feminine gentleness. No drink touched its skin up in a coaster. The wall along the stairway was festooned with photographs of the Mayfield tree, great and grand uncles and fathers, many deceased, the depictions clearly etched, fading with age. One, a former Confederate soldier, an empty sleeve pinned to his chest. And then you read Faulkner. I mean, it's... Yarbrough's a good writer. Because when you read this piece from Faulkner, it's part from Intruders in the Dust, it has a Faulkner, a Faulkner-esque quality to it. This is Faulkner. For every southern boy 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, there is in the, in the instant when it's not yet 2 o'clock on that July afternoon in 1863, the brigades are in position behind the rail fence, the guns are laid and ready in the woods, and the furled flags are already loosened to break out, and Pickett himself with his long oiled ringlets and his hat in one hand, probably in his sword in the other, looking up the hill, waiting for Longstreet to give the word, and it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even begun yet. It not only hasn't begun yet, but there is still time for it not to begin against the, that position and those circumstances which made men more which made more men than Garrett and Kemper and Armistead and Wilcox look grave. Yet it's going to begin. We all know that. We have come too far with too much at stake, and that moment doesn't need a 14-year-old boy to think this time. Maybe this time. With all this much to lose and then all this much to gain. Pennsylvania, Maryland, the world. The Golden Dome of Washington itself to crown with desperate and unbelievable victory. The desperate gamble. Maybe it's this time. And I think that's what drives us at the Institute. Maybe it's this time. We can win still. The Southern tradition can win. It won for a long time. It's been pushed down, relegated to race and slavery. And that's because we're dominated by New England America. We've got powerful forces against us. We've got the Alan Gelzos on the quote-unquote conservative side. We've got all the nut jobs on the left. And we're fighting it, but it's hard. And it can be overwhelming. And that's why we wrap up with a piece from uh, Jail Bennett, Joyce Bennett. And uh, her piece is Disunion Then and Now. And she says, look, I mean, people are people are fed up I and mean, people are starting to talk about secession more and more today. It's it's on the lips of everyone today. There's been major discussions about it in media outlets that never would have had discussions about it just 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I remember in the 90s, no one wanted to talk about this. But now it's being discussed. And why is it being discussed? Because of power, because people are starting to realize left and right, we've got real problems. And these political problems aren't going to go away with a one-size-fits-all system. And so people are saying, well, what about culture? Doesn't that matter? Don't these things matter? Uh, and, and so the Southern tradition offers, offers a, a reprieve from this. It offers an example of what we can and cannot do. And I like this piece because she, she ties all this stuff together the old secession with modern politics and modern discussions of these things and how all that's working. It's not a call for anything. She says at the end, maybe secession is the answer. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's all we have. Uh, I don't know. But the founding generation were secessionists. This is what they were. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew that. It's only been in the last little bit that we've now considered it to be treason, right, to seek self-determination, independence. The founding generation, and I, we had a conference on 
uh, nullification in, uh, in Atlanta several years ago. And I did a talk on conventions, the voice of the people, and how Americans knew that conventions were the way that you actually solve these problems. You call a convention, and the people decide these issues. You see, these secession conventions were voices of the people. The constitutional conventions were voices of the people. The ratification conventions were voices of the people of the states. And so that's the key to all of this. That's, that's part of the Southern tradition, too. That's part of it. And we have to consider all of that. You know, South Carolina in 1832 calls a convention to nullify the tariff. The Southern tradition is vital to our understanding of America. Until next time, good day.